and thank you for coming. I'd like to make this uh, talk as uh, interactive as possible. We are actually doing it for the Securum uh, boot, uh, Bootcamp. So uh, I'll start very basic, but I'll go uh, quicker. So I'm sure we all know what auditing is. Here I'm referring to the procedure that uh, a human review the code either internally or externally. And that's a review, that's a review for the code to check the correctness, uh, the code and the documentation. Uh, either it's a white hacker or, or an auditor, and it's evaluate the security of the procedure. That's a very clear at this point. Uh, it's used in many domains, but in smart contract, it's it is a mandatory. Uh, and Formal verification is less clear. So for this uh, talk, I wanted to pick up some kind of a, sort of a common ground. So let's think of something very, very different. We all know at least from Unix, there is this very useful software called diff and it compares two files. You take two files and it basically show you, for example, this is a case of a, of a Git which is used. So it will show you the difference between the files which lines are the same, which lines are different. That's a very, very useful technology. It's been around for ages and it's used in many domains uh, to check differences between uh, different text files. So formal verification for the purpose of this talk, you can think about it as a smart way to do this diffing. The idea is we compare between the code on one side and the specification on the other side. And these are sort of two separate files. One of them is written in a code, say Solidity or Rust. The other one is written in the spec language. So Tor has its own language, but there are others. And basically what this will do, it, will, it can give you actually a proof. It can tell you that all the behaviors of the code, and there are usually many, even infinite, they satisfy the rules or it can identify a behavior that could be pretty rare, which also an auditor can find, that sometimes this is show you some input that violate the spec. But the important thing is that this compares two things, okay? Uh, so this is how we view our formal verification. And uh, the interesting thing is this formal verification can actually give you bug. It can, it can, uh, it can actually identify bug. And maybe a sort of a joke that people sometimes say about formal verification is formal verification is the art of making sure that your code and the spec have the same kind of bugs. So basically you are checking the difference between these two things. Uh, formal verification is a mature field like many others in computer science, but it has been through kind of phases like uh, uh, artificial intelligence and others. So basically, Formal verification goes back as Turing, which actually in his first paper sort of explaining how you do this formal verification. And then there were these golden years where all of these people, especially from Europe, Robin Milner, Tony Ward, uh, sorry, Tony Hoare, Ed, Edgar Dijkstra, and, and, and Patrick Rousseau, and, and also Bob Floyd from the US, they all came with this technique for formal methods. Uh, I guess all of them, with the exclusion of Patrick Cousseau, they got doing a award for that. And they basically, they invented these techniques that actually make this programming into a science. And, and the biggest quote is by Dijkstra, where they say that this is the only way to prove that the code is correct. This looks very, very nice, but in fact, this was a bit naive. And what happened in the 79, there are a lot of people, but in particular, I refer to these three American computer scientists. DeMillo, Lipton, and Perlis. And they came with this paper that if you want to read why not use formal verification, this is the 78 and the 79 papers that basically explain to you why this method will never work. And this paper is still interesting and a very easy, nice read that I recommend for everybody. So this actually was very bad for the field, sort of showing that this technique is very, very hard and explaining actually with rational reason why formal method is not the way to go. But then people, including myself, we, it, it actually didn't prevent us from working on that. And basically there's a lot of work that came. In particular, I pointed out the work by the Microsoft research team 
which got the device driver formal verification to work to eliminate the blue screens in Windows. And this is a very nice quote by Bill Gates. It's also built on my, my own uh, academic work. But there are a lot of very, very interesting tools which are actually now using in Satora, like the Yikes tool, which came from Stanford Research Institute, CVC, which came from uh, Iowa and, and, uh, and Stanford University, and Z3, which came from Microsoft Research. But maybe the biggest thing for, for us, at least taking this thing to a practical merit, is actually the idea is that the smart contract or the idea of code is law, because this is a very interesting application of formal methods because you, you have small code carrying a lot of value. So the scalability issue is not an issue. If you can get formal verification to work, this is a very, very interesting domain. And also the fact that the smart contract is immutable, it makes this task that you really want to do this formal verification before the code is deployed. So the, the, the biggest value of formal verification come already from the specification. You write some properties of your code and you write the desired properties of the code. And this is called invariant, going back to Dijkstra and others. And this is actually already useful for auditing. In fact, we, we think that the auditor needs to review the specification. And the, here are some examples. There's no double spend. There is liquid, properties of liquidation. If you do this to deposit, it doesn't matter if I deposit X and deposit Y, it's like depositing X plus Y. And there are languages for writing specification. For example, Lamport has this TLA plus, which is a powerful language. The SMT checker has their own language. And we have the Satora verification language called CVL, which, which is our own language for writing rules. So maybe a very, very simple case of invariant. You see, this is the case that x plus y is greater or equal to two. So you see in the blue, in, in, the, in the green thing, you see the good point, and in, in, the, in the other, you see the bad point. So basically, for each of the value, we, we know when it satisfies the invariant or not. And usually, when we look into program state, we are interested in finding this invariant that separates the bad state from the good state. So what are interesting invariant for DeFi? So if you have a token that you are borrowing, you have to have sufficient collateral that covers this loan. A very, very simple property, even for ERC-20, the sum of the balance is equal to a total amount. When we are talking about liquidation procedure, you can think of something like in, in companies that you have the liquidity shares for or the investor and the system holding to know actually who is actually are uh, holding which value. And you see there is a correspondence. If the liquidation is share is greater than zero, if and only if the system holding is greater than zero. And, and so on and so forth, you can come with interesting environment. And this is actually the, the, big, the biggest heart of formal verification is coming with these environments. So maybe just to clarify, there are actually bad invariants, and there are many ways to write bad invariants, but here I sort of give you a few examples. So the first one is a bad invariant. X plus two is greater than X. Can somebody help me? Why is it a bad invariant? What's so wrong with it? The ontology. Exactly, it's a tautology. Basically, it is always wrong. And this is a common mistake when you work, and if you work with a tool like Sartor Kruber, in the future, actually, due to uh, things with AI, it will warn you against it. But we have actually customer with all technologies, and then the, the technology proved this technology, but this doesn't mean anything about the code. The second line is also a technology written in, a, in an even more weird way, which is very strange. What's wrong with the second line? Why is it a technology? The left-hand side of the implication is false. Exactly. It's basically false implication, so it doesn't mean anything. And there's other, and all of these things, they can be verified, but they're not interesting. And in general, we call it vacuous. And one of the things that formal verification was applied is to, for hardware verification. And they found out that many people are writing vacuous invariant, so, or vacuous specification, and you should avoid them. And we actually plan to check for them. The other case of bad environment is too restrictive. If you are requiring too much, and in, in tools like Sertora, if this happened, 
you're going to get a warning that you, the tool will find a behavior that violates these requirements. So we have a lot of about environment. Uh, I refer to James lecture, but I'm not going to go to it. So I want to talk just sort of how to write the rules, and I didn't want to stay too technical, so I'm referring to the, the idea of her. The idea is that you have basically, it's like invariant, but these are invariant of the transition. So basically, it tells you that if you start with a state which satisfies P, and you execute the, the, the contract, you find out you finish in a state which, which satisfies Q. So it's a condition on your environment. P is what you are assuming, and Q is what you are ensuring. And it's a kind of a design, it's sort of rely guarantee. This is how you build systems, and it's allow you to compose systems. And what it requires is that every execution, if you start with a state which satisfy P, it's finished with a state that satisfy Q. So basically, you see here, from this state, you go to this state. And it doesn't require anything on state outside it. OK, so the only thing which can violate it, the only thing which is for, and, and you can also write it as a code. You see, you can say, if P, then you execute the contract, and otherwise you execute, and after that, you, you, you do that session. So basically, if P does not hold, you require nothing. So basically, the only thing that it forbids is the situation which is drawn here. Yet you start with a state which is good, and you end up in a state which is bad. And this is what we write when we write rules. And the art of formal verification is writing these rules and then using them either to find bugs or prove the absence. And they are called also sometimes safety. One can also think about liveness, but I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about safety. And intuitively, safety means that nothing bad will happen, as opposed to liveness that something good will happen. But we talk in this talk about only about safety. So sort of. The specs versus the code, just sort of few basic things. That the spec is usually declarative and the code is imperative. It's actually executing things. Although there are, of course, declarative languages, but languages like Solidity or Rust, they are imperative. And CVL is meant to be very declarative. The, the, the code is complete. It's actually described how everything is executed. The spec is partial. It just describes some of these kind of common security properties. And in particular, is usable, reusable. We see that the spec is reusable between two different versions, but it's also between different DeFi. For example, you have Aave, you have Compound. They're implementing different things, but they still satisfy similar rules. And also, the spec is sort of captures the essence of the code as opposed to the code, which actually describes everything in the code. And maybe the biggest value of a spec that it's elegant or small. And of course, both of these can have bugs. They can, you can have bugs in the spec and you can have bugs in the code. So I start with a very, very simple buggy program. So this is a transfer, which is buggy. And a human can find this bug usually very easy. We have here a lot of excellent people who can find this bug. The Sator approval, in order to find this bug, you have to tell it what you are expecting from that. And the simplest thing to say you say that the total is equal to the sum of the balance. So this is an ERC-20 property. And then you see the system will automatically identify a bug, which is basically self-liquidation. The idea is Alice transfer the money to herself, then in fact, she can cheat here. And, but, and this is something that auditor also found. But the interesting thing that the Sartor approver found it automatically by comparing the code to the specification, okay? And, and what the Sator approver can also, so it basically found this bug for you when you wrote this rule. And when you change the code, when you correct the code, then it will not actually tell you that this code does not have bug, but it will still tell, at least tell you that this rule holds. So it gives you more guarantee of the code, that it tells you that this rules hold, that in fact, the sum of the balance before and after remains the same. So just to know the basic thing about formal verification is that the procedure we are looking for behaviors which are bad. So the user doesn't describe the bad things. The user describes the desired behavior. And the system is looking for the bad things. 
And this is a very, very hard computational problem. It ranges from NP complete to undecidable. But in fact, there are tools, including us, that solve this in many, many cases. And in, in code, which ranges from a 50 line to, to sometimes 5,000 line and more. And what happened when these two, when these things do not work, the user can help. There are different mechanisms for interaction. The simplest is basically modularity. You break the code into several pieces and you verify which uh, separately each code with respect to the specification. So basically formal verifi the verification and practice, I've cheated a little bit in the previous slide. You have the solidity, you can come with proofs, you can come with bugs, but there are also timeouts. There are cases that the tool runs out of time. And in fact, he didn't prove anything and he didn't find a bug. That's of course useless and we are trying to avoid that, but it's unavoidable. When the code gets too complex, this situation can happen and you can always write, because the problem is undecidable, it means that the human can always write a program and a property for which this tool will fail. Of course, we at Satora, we try to prevent it and others, uh, uh, I see people from runtime verification. Everybody has sort of mechanism that we are trying to prevent failures of the tool. Notice that this tool is still very, very useful and still useful, more useful than say common static analysis methods because it doesn't have false positive and it doesn't have false negative in a sense that every time it gives you a bug, in fact, it's a bug which violates the rule. And every time when it tells you that the rule holds, the rule is hot. So it really gives you, it increases your knowledge about your code. Uh, other things to, to notice that FCB is, on, is the only method to prove property as Dijkstra observed, but it's useless without good spec. So if you don't have the good spec, you will not get useful. You can write some generic rules like to find properties with the message senders and other, but you need some spec. You need the rules to make this useful. Uh, of course, when you work with this, especially when you are a beginner, don't be so happy and some level of paranoia is useful. So if the formal verification gave you a bug, check it, of course. But if the formal verification say no bug, the, the, the first thing to check is that whether there is a, it's a problem with your specification and you can mutate the program and try to see that you even manually insert a bug and see what happens. So basically check the tool and on some level, if you work with the tool, including ours, it's very, very useful to to basically check the, useful, the, the usefulness of the tool by changing your program and see if, if the rule is valid. Uh, so I want to now go to more technical examples and I will use the sushi example, which is lovely in this space. So I think it's, a, there are, it's interesting also, I see we have also Samsung in the code, which has actually found a bug after us. It's very interesting. So we actually work with the sushi team for quite a long time. It's a fairly complex code. We identified many, many bugs and prevented them before the code is deployed. And I wanted to show you the first purpose of this is showing you actually some kind of useful environment. There are more useful environments and I believe that the environment here are useful even beyond the sushi, but feel free to interrupt me here. So this is a very tricky code, which has a lot of advanced features for liquidation. And let's start with the simplest uh, version of liquidation. I think it's Kashi pair. Uh, uh, so basically there is, you see the state outside the system and the state inside the system and inside the system there is Alice and say Alice borrowed 100 uh, ether and uh, the collateral is 120. And suppose that the value that you're requiring now, the, the, the ratio is one to 1.3. This means that at this point now, Alice is in trouble. She actually, uh, uh, sort of her collateral does not suffice for her borrow. So somebody else has the incentive to come and cover Alice's law, okay? So in this case, you see Bob here. Bob, Bob has a sufficient borrow and Bob can come and have and, and, and cover Alice's law. So that's what happened. It executes the liquidate Alice Bob with a message sender being Bob. And now it execute that. What will happen is that Alice loan is covered. The, uh, the Bob, 
is get some reward because you can get the collateral and the system also covered the loan. So basically this is an idea where actually Bob has the incentive to cover, it's a lovely idea that Bob has the incentive to cover Ellis loan. So that's a very good idea. It's implemented in the liquidate procedure. And here is a simplified version of the code. There is this batch call and batch call is calling liquidation. Batch call is wrapping several uh, 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 a transaction in, in one transaction. And now suppose you want to check it and you are auditor, of course, you will review it. You can think you can uh, apply useful methods like unit testing. So we can try to check it, but there are a lot of behavior. You have to check it on any contact list. You have to check any function. So that's very, very hard to find what bugs is here. And, 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 and when you are reviewing this code, even though this code is simple, it can be actually pretty tricky. Okay, so we go and we go back to these hot reports. We want to define some rules that say, how is the good properties of liquidation? And this is a good property that the sushi protocol have and others. And in this case, if you have collateral and if, if you have borrow, they are complementary. This means if the borrow token increases, you expect the collateral token to, to decrease. And this is a property that you're looking for outside the system independent of its implementation. So for example, if the collateral is 100 and the borrower is 16, then you can increase the borrower to 70 and reduce the collateral to 90. You can increase the borrower to 80 and, 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 and reduce the collateral to, to 80, but you cannot do that. You cannot actually do this. You cannot actually, so this is something that we don't expect. And this is a behave, bad behavior. So we want to actually write an environment that enforce this behavior. Okay, and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna write the code. And this is exactly the whole trip. You take this liquidate and you surround it by rules. In Sartora, you write the rules in, in slightly more verbose manner, but I wrote it here more like mathematically. B is equal to the borrow, C is equal to the collateral, and then the borrow is greater that the borrow after the action is greater to B if and only if the collateral after the action is, is, is less than C. And this is what we do. And you can actually read in the verification report, this is the property that we are trying to verify. And we are running the tool. Uh, I'm not gonna do it. It takes a little, I don't know, takes a one minute, but you see the output of the tool. The basically the tool gave you a, a violation of the atomicity of liquidation. You can see, I, I will share the slide. It actually will give you the trace that show you the violation of the liquidation. And basically it will show you the EBM state uh, in this transaction, how it is violated. And if you look at it up, you see that actually this is a pretty interesting bug and it's a pretty severe bug that was identified by comparing the, the goods pack to the, to the code. And basically what the system allowed is that Mallory, she can actually gain money without actually paying anything. So Mallory doesn't have anything to cover. It is calling, and in this case, it's using message sender being herself. So Mallory is calling with the message sender being herself. As a result, there is this liquidation with the message sender being this. And the system pays itself. So basically Alice loan is covered, Mallory pays nothing, and Mallory uh, uh, basically gets the, uh, it gets the, the, the Alice uh, 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 borrow, and it basically gets money without, sorry, gets Alice collateral uh, without paying nothing. So that's a very, very bad behavior. And of course the Sushi team, uh, luckily we told them this before the code was deployed. And they change the code. There are different ways to change the code. One way to change the code, which is simple, but our technology actually can win with others. As you see, you make the message sender not equal to address. So you change the code. And then the tool here will tell you that all the rules hold. Again, it doesn't mean that you don't have bugs, but it means that at least you verify these rules that they hold before the code is deployed. Questions so far? Okay, no question, okay. 
So I want to show you another interesting bug, uh, actually more recent, and I think it's equally beautiful. And there is also the from Dora the uh, blog about it. So this is Trident. Uh, Trident is a very interesting case because the sushi team work with us and work with auditors and work also with Code Arena. And a guy from Code Arena, actually, I think, I don't know if he's in the call, I think it's Chris, but he actually found the issue is just that we, uh, we actually knew what's the issue, but he did find this issue. It's a very, very interesting issue in the code. And basically it's an issue that allow you to, to deplete the contract. So what happened here, we, are, we have users, we have the router and we have liquidity pools and they are manipulating in an interesting way. And uh, uh, the property that we want is exactly the same property that we have seen earlier that we said that there is a correlation between the liquidation and the, system, and the holding of the system. So this is written here just specifically. So it's the same environment that we've seen earlier just waiting now specifically. So basically it says either total liquidity, token balance and, to and token balance of the system is zero or so either all of them is zero or either uh, or all of them is non-zero. So basically you have token A and token B and liquidity pool. And now, wait, and now you are doing external transfer. So basically what happened is that you increase the amount of token A, but the system, and that's sort of a tricky case that the system is not aware that you increase the token A. So you increase that in a way that the system in the internal data structure is not aware of it. And now you are executing an operation which called burn single. And what burn single does, you are burning token A and the system, because it actually is confused about the level of token, you can burn this token A so you are left with one token or zero token. So this is a case that the environment is broken. At this point, it looks bad, but the question is what can happen, okay? So basically what you happen now, you see, and the liquidity tokens were reduced, and but you basically was able to withdraw the, 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 the token B. And what happened now, now we are in this situation, this is a bad situation. And what can you do? You can basically swap this one token for everything. So you basically ended up actually replacing and you are basically taking all the money from the system. So you take this uh, uh, one token or zero token B and you replace it with token A. So this is a very bad situation. And luckily we were able to report it to the Sushi team before the code was deployed and they fixed the code and after that, we prove the environment. So basically we prove the environment of the system holding. So I want to ask some uh, people from the audience, especially if they are not from Satora, tell me what's wrong about this property and whether this, so you don't know what's up, but what's wrong about this wood? Maybe some, what is wrong about this wood? The or in the post condition looks a little iffy to me. No, no, but the question is, will this rule hold? So the answer is this rule will always hold. Yeah. Depend of the code. Why is that? The post condition I think is probably vacuous. Exactly. The idea is that as Mike pointed out, if you know that the kernel owner equals owner, and other is not equal to current owner, then there's no way that this could be violated. So when you run the Satura approver, the Satura approver will tell you that they will hold, but it means nothing. So we are now incorporating into the tool the ability to check vacuous rules. So the idea is you want to check that, like in the model checking, like in others, that, that these will they, they hold, but it means nothing. You have to actually make sure that you write rules which are useful. So rules which are useful are rules without checking something about the op. So this is a case, no matter what op is, this rule will hold. So we don't want to have this kind of vacuous rules. 
So I want to actually uh, sort of uh, wrap up. Sorry that I had uh, some technical problem, but actually this is a very important part of the talk of sort of trying to uh, explain or understand how people work with these kind of methods. And I think we are still learning it. So obviously when you write code, everybody knows the best code starts with a good design, having a white paper, everything that's useful. Of course, you can have bug there. There are maybe tools, but not ours, but there are, could be design bugs, of course. And from there on, you write the code and the test, but we require also to have the spec because we think that this is something that we bring into the table, that you have the ability to write the specification. So you want you to write the spec, the code and the test. And then there is this manual procedure, call it QA or testing, or maybe there are some tools. You check the code and the spec and the test. So basically you run the code on some test input and you check if the spec is right or wrong and you can actually already identify some bugs there. That's already useful being unit testing or system testing, that's very useful. Then this is where we come into play. We're gonna offer, and we're already inserting now, tools for checking specification, like vacuous, tautology, what we said. So this will actually reveal bugs in the spec. These are not bugs in your code, it's bugs in the spec, but as we said, they can happen and we need to check them. We already have some kind of sanity rules, but we need to check bugs in the spec because me, people have mistakes in that. And, and of course, this can go back, you go back and you check the, co the correctness of the spec. Then this is something that we're gonna offer soon, but we didn't offer initially, but there are other tools like slitters and other, we're gonna fuzz, we're gonna fuzz, we're gonna basically try this on some input. This will not actually give you proof, but at least will give you some violation of the spec or you can think about it as a mechanism to generate more test input. So it will basically augment your original test input with other test input that actually uh, uh, show you something about the spec. And of course we are interested in violation, but sometimes even finding behaviors which are good for the spec. And then comes the manual auditing. That's a very, very useful procedure where the human actually can identify other bugs in the design bugs in the spec, bugs in the code, and this can be executed anytime. But of course, since it's a costly and since a human is involved, you want actually to, to execute it, to do any automation before you can do it or after you can do it, that, that's fine. So basically this is the manual procedure. We think that the only difference between what the common practice that they need to audit the rules. So if they audit the rules, they will find actually, in addition to finding bugs in the in the code, they will also find bugs in the rules. And then if, at the end comes the formal verification. So that's a procedure that we run or you can run other tools. And this uh, formal verification, it will check the code and it can find bugs. And we actually found many, many bugs after auditors. And this is human versus the machine. If we have the right rules, we can identify bugs after the auditor. And even if we don't identify bugs, it's increased your knowledge of the code. It says that in addition to what the auditor check, we check these particular rules. And the output of this procedure is the, so the output of that is that you have a proof that the rules that you wrote are correct. And of course, each of these phase, you can go back even to this time. So each of these phase, if it's broken, you go back to the beginning. So this is, these are the seven steps that you have to make your code correct. So maybe to wrap up the talk, basically there are sort of this domain, as I said, is a mature domain, but there are some things that still require some thought. So in particular, what's known from hardware verification is that usually you think of formal verifications producing proofs, but the biggest value of formal verification of tools like Sertora and others and model checking is the same is that finding bugs. So the biggest value is that the tool actually identifies bugs in the rules. The common wisdom is that hardest problem is computational, which is of course the case, but what we see and many others is that specification is equally hard and sometimes harder problem because, and if you go back to the DeMillo, you'll find that too. Basically, what are the requirements for correctness? This case, DeFi is a very interesting domain we, because we are coming up with these essential rules of DeFi like with liquidations and others, but it's actually in general a very hard problem how to come to the specification. And this is a community effort. 
And the last thing about formal verification, usually when, we, when people thought about formal verification, they thought about the one-time deal, like proving the correctness of a compiler, something like this. But in the case of DeFi and many others evolving software, it's a case that the software always evolves. So there's not a one-time deal. Every time you change the code, you probably have to do auditing and you also have to do formal verification and you have to do it every little change in the code. And this is where formal verification scares because you can run the rules again and again and again as part of the CI. So maybe sort of the uh, almost the last, no silver bullet for code correctness and formal verification auditing are required for code correctness. And what we think the uh, formal verification brings to the play is the specification, the ability to change the paradigm from code is low to spec is low and that writing spec that people can read and critique and review, like for example, invariant or correctness rules like four triples. And finally, the tooling, and this is what Sertora is loves to do, to develop some tools. At the moment, we are fuzzing formal verification, but can, we can think of testing, monitoring, and others. So these are tools which improve correctness. So thank you for your time, and I'd love to take some questions.